I'm Adrian Finnegan, and this is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, it's described as the world's most ambitious climate plan. The EU's Green Deal, though, is facing serious challenges. So could the bloc's election results affect its future? An historic rebuke for South Africa's ruling party in parliamentary elections. Has the ANC failed on the economy? And will sharing power help it fix the nation's woes? And Afghanistan has been cut off from the international banking system for a few years now, but the Taliban government says that it is becoming financially self-reliant. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen unveiled the bloc's climate plan in 2019, calling it Europe's man-on-the-moon moment. That landing of the so-called Green Deal, though, is now in question. The package is aimed at making the EU's economy carbon neutral by 2050 at a cost of more than $1 trillion in investments every year. The next European Commission will be tasked with raising more funds for the package, but support for it among voters is declining as the energy crisis bites and impacts household incomes. The possible rise of right-wing parties after parliamentary elections could see the bloc backpedal on some measures, as Katia lopez Horayan reports. It's the world's most ambitious climate plan. The European Union's Green Deal is meant to revamp the bloc's economy, from Europe's energy sector to transportation and agriculture. But shifting to a green economy has been controversial and expensive. About $400 billion have been invested from EU funds to finance some of its green projects. We are also fostering the development of innovative technologies. This promotional video wants to assure Europeans things are on track. Let's see how the European Green Deal is making a real difference on the ground. But some say the Green Deal is an expensive political liability and one that will force the EU to backtrack some of its measures, particularly in light of the European Parliament elections. I think the areas where it will be harder to gain majorities in the new parliament will be on the climate agenda. So if you ask that question um, in France or the Netherlands, they'll say the climate crisis has most changed their thinking about the future. If you um, ask the, that question in Germany or Austria, the biggest response is the immigration crisis. Critics say families are struggling to make ends meet and money would be better spent elsewhere. Two thirds of voters say tackling the rising cost of living in the EU needs to be a priority including help with rising energy prices. I see that every month the prices keep rising. I'm a mom with a single income and two kids, and it's really difficult. Farmers have their own grievances. Most recently, farmers from Spain and France blocked roads near their border, opposing agricultural regulations. Their protests have led to concessions before, but they want more to be done. We need unfair competition to stop. There should be the same requirements for Europe or, say, in Spain and France compared to products that are sold here from Morocco, for example. The pushback is a far cry from when the Green Deal was first introduced in 2019 as a way to restore the environment and renew Europe's economy. We do not have all the answers yet. Today is the start of a journey. But this is Europe's man on the moon moment. Five years since the plan was first introduced, its future now hangs in the balance, nestled between demands for climate action and the economic pains of a green transition. Katia Lopez Odoyan, Al Jazeera, for counting the cost. Let's get stuck into this with Anne Pettifor, who's an economist who regularly advises government and is the author of The Case for the Green New Deal. She joins us now from London. Anne, good to have you with us. So, has the world's most ambitious climate deal become a political liability? I'm afraid it has, and it's not so much a liability as a refusal of European leaders to, t to tackle what is going to be what is a great security threat to the people of Europe. And that's because there's a political vacuum at the heart of Europe. On the one hand, you have the very conservative German finance minister uh, absolutely insisting that there can be no common borrowing across the union, no common debt issuance. That means raising the finance means going and taxing individuals. And at a time of the cost of living crisis, that is untenable. 
At the same time as on the green front, the Greens have tended to ensure that the burden of adjustment, the burden of transition, falls on, if you like, the 99%, those who are suffering the cost of living crisis. Instead of aiming, in my view, they should be aiming at those who are responsible for the bulk of emissions, i.e. the wealthy, the, the private jet owners, the, the ones that own super yachts, the, the big polluters, not, not, not uh, millions of ordinary households who are struggling to make ends meet. So this combination of, on the one hand, the conservatism in particular of the German finance ministry and the refusal to consider working jointly, that combined with the insistence that actually the people must pay for this at a time of uh, cost of living crisis, those two things, I think, make it really very challenging to renew the uh, financing for the Green Deal. And I suppose that explains why people are moving uh, their support towards more right-wing parties. Do you expect the next EU parliament then to, to water down the objectives of the Green Deal? I, I think, you know, that probably will happen if, if the financing is not available. I mean, back in 2020, Europe did an amazing thing the European governments came together and issued the corona bond to deal with the crisis of that time. And it was marvellous. It was a uniting uh, action, and it was something that it delivered results without actually demanding higher taxes on, the indiv on individuals inside the European Union. And, 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 th and that was rewarded with an increased investment and then jobs and then tax revenues from that increased investment. The fact that Europe won't think about that now is down to the conservatism of, of as I say, the German finance ministry. But it is also, uh, uh, therefore, seeping, that politics is seeping through into the far right, who are willing support because people feel it's not fair that they should carry the burden of this adjustment. Where does this leave individual EU governments, then? EU states uh, 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 caught between a rock and a hard place, doesn't it? I mean, I think France will go ahead. France is very ambitious. I mean, really, what we all have to do is to look at what China is doing. China isn't waiting. China is using the state to invest in the transformation to support the private sector and to enable the private sector to, for example, produce um, green energy, to produce uh, cars that are uh, uh, electric cars, for example, is their big uh, investment. And they don't do this without state support. And the fact that the U European Union is led by politicians who believe the state should not play a role in this means that we are falling behind both China and the United States, where the Biden administration has used the state to stimulate and to support investment, both in the public but also the private sector. So how does Brussels go about selling this to, to the electorate now and to, to individual EU states? Well, I think Brussels has to bang heads together, essentially. The problem isn't the people of Europe. The people of Europe are perfectly well aware that of the scale of the climate crisis. They're, in, they're enduring it at the moment. They just don't want to... They just feel it's unfair to ask those, the poorest, the most vulnerable in society, if you like, and that includes a lot of the middle classes, to pay for this transition at a time when they're also having to deal with other errors that the leaders of the union have made. So I think the role of, of Brussels is to bang political heads together, and in particular to for Mr Scholz in Germany, to, to have the courage to take the lead and override his uh, minority party, freedom, uh, well, I forget what they called, but the party that is in charge of the finance ministry, and actually to act over and above that. That's what it takes. It takes some political courage. What's your feeling, Anne? Is the EU, EU still on course to hit its net zero target by, by 2050? And, and uh, what are the consequences of, of not hitting that target? Well, without financing, it's not going to be possible because this is a major task of completely transforming the economy away from its dependence, from its addiction to fossil fuels. You know, we're going to have to compensate corporations and companies who are going to have to make losses. They're going to have to give up, um, you know, oil and gas and and, carb and carbon emitting uh, energy. And 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 to so that's going to have to be compensated for and to be financed. So without that, what we're doing, what Europe is doing, is leaving her people vulnerable 
vulnerable to floods, droughts, harvest failures, agricultural losses, massive agricultural losses from climate breakdown. And that is to fail in their duty to protect the security of the citizens of Europe. In that, they are failing. And, and people are disillusioned. They're turning to the right, to strong men, if you like, and women, in the case of Europe, for protection from market forces that are harming their livelihoods and their opportunities. And they're turning away from mainstream politicians. So that will make it ve very much harder to raise the finance needed. We need some leadership from those who support the Green New Deal, not uh, cowardice. It's really good to talk to you, Anne. Many thanks indeed for being with us on Counting the Cost. Thank you. Anger is growing in Europe over the continent's housing crisis. Shortages of affordable housing have sparked protests in Lisbon, Amsterdam, Prague, Milan and outside the EU in London. Eurostat data shows that across the 27-member bloc, house prices jumped by 47% between 2010 and 2022, while rents rose 18% over the same period. Recent research has found a link between rising rents and votes for the far right on the continent. The World Bank says that one in three Lebanese is poor in what was once an upper-middle-income country. Lebanon's economy began to unravel five years ago. The International Monetary Fund says that leaders haven't done enough to address the crisis. Zaina Hoda reports from Beirut. Five years into Lebanon's economic collapse, there's still no accountability for the $70 billion wiped from its banking system. Instead, depositors have been denied access to their money, which was borrowed by a now nearly bankrupt state. Years of corruption blamed on the political and business elites have impoverished society and in Michel Iliovitz's case are threatening his life. He needs a heart transplant. If I had my money, I can go to Germany. In Germany, they can uh, provide me with a heart and they can provide me with uh, uh, the medical health care for 120,000 US dollars. Since I don't have it, uh, I'm, I'm waiting to die. The middle class has practically vanished. One in three Lebanese is now poor. That means they earn less than $90 a month. Not only has the number of impoverished people increased, the World Bank says they're also getting poorer. In a recent survey, the International Financial Institution said three quarters of the population are like Abu Bakr, who struggles to have access to services like electricity and education. At one point, I stopped my studies because I couldn't pay the fees. Now I have to work to finish my education. Life is particularly hard for those who don't have access to foreign currency. They are exposed to escalating inflation. Over the past five years, Lebanon's economy has shrunk. Its currency has collapsed and inflation has skyrocketed. And while more people are out of work and public services crumble, there is a vacuum in the executive authority. This is no longer an upper middle income country. So sometimes I had my tears uh, in my eyes because I cannot do what I used to do. I'm not begging. I am not, I don't want to be uh, as a beggar to ask for help. I just want my money. They will not give it to me. And political leaders have yet to implement a recovery plan. Zane Khudr Al Jazeera for counting the cost. Now, it came to power 30 years ago at the end of apartheid, guaranteeing the rights of all citizens, regardless of race, religion or gender. But many say that South Africa's African National Congress has failed to deliver on its promises. It's being blamed for the nation's high inequality and unemployment rates, and the ANC appears to have paid a high price in the recent parliamentary elections. Nelson Mandela's liberation movement has lost its majority for the first time since 1994 and will now have to share power with other parties. So how will that affect South Africa's economy? We'll discuss it with our guests shortly, but first, this report. So help me God. It's been the dominant force in South African politics for 30 years. The African National Congress, or ANC, was elected in 1994 on a promise to build a better life for all. 
winning more than 60 percent of the vote in the country's first fully inclusive election. It brought an end to three centuries of racist apartheid policies. But after three decades in power, black South Africans say the ANC has broken its promises. The ANC used to be the political party that uh, it's been there for the, for the black majority, uh, only to find out that they are not there. In last week's election, the party managed to secure only 40 percent of the vote, forcing it to try a form of coalition government. Our people have spoken. Whether we like it or not, they have spoken. The economy in recent years has been defined by stagnation and exclusion, with black South Africans bearing the brunt. It's a lesson for ANC that they got 40 percent, that they must speed up their system and do service delivery to the people, because the people are hungry, people are struggling. White South Africans typically earn more than four times as much as black South Africans, who account for more than 80 percent of the population. Unemployment and poverty remain concentrated among the black majority. A third of the labor force is unemployed. That's more than in war-torn Sudan. But business owners say they are not sure if a coalition government is the answer to their problems. Coalition it makes the province or the government go slow because there are always negotiations. There are always negotiations, but what can you say? We'll see what's, 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 what's happening. <laughs> the ANC could align with parties that push for center-right policies, such as privatization, or with leftist parties that call for the nationalization of reserves and the central bank. While South Africans wait to see if a government can be formed, they can only hope that a coalition politics will mark for them the beginning of a new era of prosperity. Fung Yingwian, Al Jazeera, for counting the cost. For more on this, we're joined by Mo Letzi Mbeki, who's a political analyst and the chairman of the South African Institute of International Affairs, a think tank based at the University of uh, Witzfortersrand. Good to have you with us, sir. Now, over the last 30 years in South Africa, poverty levels have fallen, people have had access to better housing, a better health care. On average, people have become richer. So why has the ANC been accused of mismanaging the economy? Well, initially people got richer, but over the last 15 years, in per capita terms, people have actually become poorer. The GDP per capita of South Africa has been declining since 20, 2008. So that's what has been happening. Uh, in the country. Nearly a third of South Africans are unemployed right now. Why is that? And what should the, the, the previous ANC-led administration have done to fix that? Well, there, there are many factors, of course. Uh, one of the factors uh, is that the South African economy is a mineral-driven economy. And it, and that, to some extent, it is both a, a positive and a negative. Uh, it's a positive in the sense that we have huge uh, natural resources, but export of natural resources causes what is called a Dutch disease, which means that it makes our manufacturing expensive. Uh, and this is what we have been seeing in South Africa has been the, the deindustrialization of, of our economy uh, during the last 15 or 20 years. South Africa is also, at the moment, the most unequal country in the world. What's behind that? Well, it's partly the history, but what, what, has, what has been happening in South Africa is that, is that the policies of the ANC government have been focused on developing as a, a small black middle class. Uh, so resources have been transferred from the rest of the economy to this hugely very highly paid black middle class, especially in the, in the, in the public sector. This has had uh, the, the result of 
undermining investment in infrastructure, in job creation because of, of this consumption of the middle class that, that, that the policies of the uh, ANC government have been driving. And that's one of the major problems uh, with our economy and with inequality. In fact, today, there's more inequality amongst the black people than there is between black and white because of this mushrooming of the black middle class, but at the expense of the rest of the economy, which is at a standstill. So what uh, will the next administration, the, the, the coalition government, have to prioritise as far as the economy is concerned? Well, as far as the economy is concerned, what, one of the top priorities must be to remove the control of electricity supply and logistics from the state and give it to competent private companies to, to operate. That's one. The second one, it will have to get rid of what we call here black economic empowerment, which gives percentage of companies to, to the black middle class, especially uh, party members of the ruling party. 26% uh, of your company, if you set up a company in South Africa, you have to give 26% of the shares to this black middle class, uh, which is called black economic empowerment. That also has to go because it's a huge disincentive to companies investing. How long do you think it's going to take to turn South Africa's economy around? And, and enough to satisfy the, the born free generation, those born after the end of apartheid? Well, it's not going to take very long to turn the economy around because South African economy is a, is a very commercial economy. It has a, a very important, a very powerful infrastructure. The infrastructure has not been maintained in the last 30 years, so it has deteriorated. Uh, so if you rehabilitate the infrastructure and you start rebuilding, for example, low-income housing, this can turn the economy around very quickly. And what, sir, do you make of the, the economic uh, agendas of uh, the various parties that could make up a, a coalition with the ANC? Well, well they, as far as I can make out, the, the, there's a whole... Lit we, remember, we have more than 300 political parties that are registered, and 52 of them contested the, 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 national, the national parliament. So you can imagine all sorts of crazy ideas are there in, the, in, in, their, in their manifestos. Uh, but there is nothing really serious in their manifesto, including the manifesto of the ruling party. Really good to talk to you, sir, on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Thank you. Saudi Arabia's oil giant Aramco started a massive share sale to raise around $12 billion last week. It's the state company's second public offering since 2019. The kingdom is seeking funds to help pay for a multi-trillion dollar mega project as uh, part of an economic transformation plan. Saudi Arabia has chalked up its sixth consecutive quarterly budget deficit amid falling oil revenues. Egypt will raise the price of heavily subsidised bread for the first time in decades. The price of bread will jump 300% to 20 piastres per loaf starting this month. State support for other services, including fuel and electricity, have recently been lifted. A hike in bread prices sparked unrest in the late 1970s and forced then-President Anwar Sadat to reverse course. The United Nations is said to be bringing in up to $80 million worth of cash shipments every two weeks to sustain its operations in Afghanistan. Now, despite the shrinking economy, cut off from international banking, the Taliban government says that it is able to sustain itself and increase public expenditure. Al Jazeera's Osama bin Javed has more from Torkam in eastern Afghanistan. From hair dryers to stainless steel pots and from chrome car trimmings to corrosion-free alloys. These chromite rocks are vital for all of them. That demand means the price per tonne has jumped three times in the last few years, and mines like this churn out 250 tonnes per day. Minerals like chromite are the backbone of the Afghan economy and a lifeline for its current rulers. 
these workers are the lucky ones because unemployment has doubled. The UN says Afghanistan's economy has contracted by 27% since the Taliban takeover in 2021. The UN is set to be transferring up to $80 million in cash shipments every fortnight to sustain its operations. That's because international banking remains unavailable because of sanctions. And the Afghan Central Bank's $9 billion in reserves have been held outside Afghanistan. That includes $7 billion, which the United States says it will split into a fund for 9-11 legal claims and payments. Afghans call it illegal and, quote, daylight robbery. But the Taliban government says it has been able to generate enough funds to be able to pay salaries and increase annual spending. We generate income internally from three different sources, taxes, customs duties and non-tax sources like mine royalties and government services, such as licenses, passports and visas. These are our main sources of income. In the past, there was no security. The republic system was not autonomous, and other people set the tax laws. At the moment, the nation is in the hands of the sons of the soil. The transport industry plays a key role in providing much-needed liquidity in the economy. Millions of dollars are being generated from customs by trucks like these traversing from one corner to the other side of Afghanistan. None of these are new sources, but previously rampant corruption is no longer as visible. The finance ministry told Al Jazeera that it is open to any international audit to challenge its claim of zero corruption. Issues such as women's education, civil rights and the rigidity of Afghanistan's interim government are still impeding progress. But Afghans are also critical of Western countries who propped up an aid economy for decades and are now not paying enough attention to the needs of millions of Afghans. Osama bin Javed Al Jazeera. Torkham. And that's our show for this week. If you'd like to comment on anything that you've seen, I'm at A Finnegan on X. Please use the hashtag AJCTC or you could drop us a line. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our email address. As always, there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That takes you straight to our page and there you'll find individual reports, links and entire episodes for you to catch up on. But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Adrian Finnegan from the team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.